Lent is a season of beginning again, of restarting. Our spiritual journeys are full of, of stops and starts, of failures and new beginnings. In the Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy and the Scarecrow find Tin Man, he is stuck, <laughs> literally and figuratively. He can't move on the side of the road. You remember, right, the scene where he's trying so hard to talk, to express his feelings, and he can't even do that anymore. But he'd already gone a ways on the journey, we think. He was sidelined. He had taken a stop, or something in his life had caused him to, to be stumped, to be paralyzed in his, in his life work of moving forward. He had lost his voice in the midst of this. He had lost his ability to help in the midst of this. He needed a restart. I don't know if you've noticed our sculptures are changing and moving. You are a part of this. Our little baubles that we've had, our shards, first of the storm in our life. Then the second week we had our blue and white, remember, to remind us of Dorothy and the one who leads us on that journey. Or, well, she's not the one that leads us on our journey but a reminder of that. And then our road is beginning to emerge on our new sculpture as we add our names and our struggles and our hopes uh, to these sculptures. They will remind us, not just now, but into the year to come as they're planted around our building of what God is doing in us, how God is leading us forward. In Psalm 32 today, We are reminded that a restart is needed but difficult. And it requires one thing that we don't exactly appreciate. Confession. To acknowledge the, the hurts of our life, the sin of our life, the places where we have made mistakes. This is not an easy thing to do. But my mom said, lots of times, confession is good for the soul. She told me that when I was a pretty small child. I'm not sure I knew what confession was, and I was just figuring out what a soul was. But it's one of those mantras that I remember from my childhood that I knew she wanted me to remember. Confession is good for the soul. Now, depending on which branch of the Protestant movement you're involved in, over time, we have put this on the back burner. We certainly are less likely to do as Roman Catholics do and go to the priest and confess our souls and, and be afraid to come communion if we have not done that. We can debate who should hear our confessions, if it's between us and other persons or our accountability group or, or just a direct prayer to God. Do we have to speak them out loud or can they be said silently? But I think certainly there is one thing we know, that confession is necessary and like my mom said, it is good for our soul. There is a cleansing action when we acknowledge both the sins of commission, those things that we do, and those sins of omission, those places where we have not been or done or said what we ought to be or do or say. There's another spiritually defeating quality that can do what the tin man had done to him, that is put him on the sideline paralyzed. Sometimes it is not our sin that affects us, it's the sins of others or the way the world works that sidelines us. And so we are sidelined, we are paralyzed by our struggle with loss and with past pain. Things that continue to infect our lives and affect us even though they are in the past. The Tin Man, or some have called the Tin Woodsman, because in the in the movie, it's different than the book, and there's several versions of the book and other stories that flow out of it. The wizard, in The Wizard of Oz, the tin man is cursed by the wicked witch, and his curse is that he no longer can have the love of his life. That he's separated from the one he loved so much and wanted to spend his life with. This pain encumbers him. It paralyzes him. It makes him unable to be the person that he was made to be. Many of us complain that we have trouble remembering as we get older. Probably none of you have that problem, right? I want to think it's a recent occurrence for me, but I'm not so sure. 
But I have to admit that often it's not remembering that's so much the problem, it's forgetting. Forgetting the things that we need to forget and move on from. We remember everything and we hold them near to our hearts. And sometimes it's those very things that paralyze us, that keep us from building new relationships, to trying new things, to being creative in God, and to taking the next step on our journey. Psychologists and spiritual mentors alike remind us that the past plays a powerful role in the present and will affect our future if not dealt with. In fact, psychologists estimate that 50% of our emotional energy is spent trying to repress painful memories. Imagine that. That 50% of our time and energy is spent trying to deal with stuff that's already over, that's gone, that's past. Many of us have had experiences of trauma or loss. In fact, who here hasn't had some experience? of trauma or loss. The effects of these trauma are, are carried with us. They're carried in our hearts and often it is those traumas that keeps us broken, unable to move, unable to speak, unable to do, not even for ourselves and certainly not for God. We could have experienced some emotional or physical abuse some broken relationship that we never got over, some sense of abandonment from somebody who's walked away for us, a loss of a closed loved one, an assault that we experienced, the loss of a job, and there is bitterness that takes root that makes it difficult for us to keep moving. But represented in this body this morning is... I think one of the most interesting things as a pastor is my view. The choir has a similar view, but it's to look out at all of you. It is the most beautiful and troubling picture. And what I mean by that is I see the smiles on your face, but I also know that behind those smiles are deep things that we bear. Traumas and struggles and pain and brokenness that I will never know all those pieces. But I have to say, over years of serving as a pastor of a church, you begin to put pieces together and to see behind eyes and to know the struggles that we have borne together or separately and the pain that people bring to this point and to this place. And I'm sure the choir has the same experience, many of whom have been here a long time and interacted in small groups and in opportunities to bless and minister to one another. What are the pains you bring today? What has broken your heart? It could have been a callous affair, an internal conflict which caused you to be reactive and carry out violence in words or action against others. Maybe it's an inability to show proper affection to ones that are close to you. Maybe it's the guilt for the loss of someone you love that you thought, maybe I could have done a little bit more to help and I could have helped avoid that situation. Maybe it's a kind word that you should have said. An impulse you had to write a card or say a prayer or make a phone call and you didn't take it. We carry this baggage, this stuff with us. The weight of all our past sin and the sins of others visited on us it's always there, too often carried with us when it doesn't need to be. The problem is articulated in Psalm 32, verse 3. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Maybe you're feeling like that today. That you just carried this crap long enough. And it's time to get rid of it. Not not get rid of the people, get rid of the stuff that you carry. The pressures and the guilt, the decided anger or sadness that's in your heart. How can we live today and do what God has called us to do as individuals and as a church if we spend half our time and energy dealing with stuff that's already passed? How can we put that away? How can we leave that behind? How can we heal and allow God to heal our broken hearts. God invites us to a way of dealing with our past. 
God offers to roll away from you and from me what I would call the disgrace. I, I say it that way so that we'll put them together because sometimes I think when we say they were in disgrace, we don't think about it as denying the very love of God that has been supplied and offered to us in Christ Jesus. Disgrace is accepting that we aren't deserving of grace, that we don't have grace, that we don't know it and we don't need it. But God offers to take that away. We sing the song Amazing Grace, but do we believe the song? Amazing grace. Because the amazing part about it is that God can forgive even me and even you. Dorothy and Scarecrow were messengers of grace. They walked along the path and they found a tin man all seized up and hurting and unable to move. And what did they do? They conversed about how they might help. They grabbed the oil can and they ran over to him as he was struggling to express himself and they helped him be free enough that he could share what was going on and explain to them his problem and his pain. In our psalm today, we find probably King David writing about his situation. But he understands what it means to confess because he did a lot of stuff he needed to confess about. But I can laugh, but the truth is, he's not unique in that, is he? Which sin is he referring to as he discusses the pain of keeping silence and his bones falling apart and rotting? I really don't know. Was it his affair with Bathsheba, another man's wife? Was it the cover-up that followed? Was it the murder that he instructed? Was... Or maybe it was the pain of his son's death. The son he loved but could never get through to. The son who died without ever having made proper amends. The list could continue, but I want you to continue the list with your own set, your own struggles, your own pain. What is it that is keeping you from fully embracing the call of God on your life? Yes, but the grace of God on your life. The Lord doesn't ask us to bear the weight of our sin. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus says, I will bear the weight of your sin. I will walk this journey with you. Leave the pain behind. I will expend my energy on your pain. I will absorb your suffering so that you don't have to, so that you can be who God wants you to be and that your broken heart will be replaced by a whole heart. Living in the past is a dangerous way to live. David realized that he is dying under the weight of past sins and the memories of his failure. So he chooses to confess his sins. To come clean with God. He says, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I love the way that's phrased. It's not just about the get out of jail free card, you might say. It's also about the guilt that goes along with it, the mental struggles, the spiritual struggles that come from knowing how we've harmed people, how we have hurt people in the past, and inviting God's forgiveness. He instructs and hopes with this phrase, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. This morning is one of those opportunities where God may be found. Right here, right now, for you. He says, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. And what he means is, for those who lay their hearts at the altar of God and say, forgive me, I want you to carry this burden for me, God. I want to leave it behind so I can spend 100% of my energy focused on loving others, sharing the love that you have shared with me with others in this world. Confession at the time of judgment he suggests it will be too late. Let's get it over with. Let's do it now. Let's come straight and clean with God in this moment. So when mighty waters come, we're prepared and they won't rise to the level of our faith or God's faithfulness to us and that the consequences that could be will not be because of the grace of God and the removal of disgrace. When we confess, we acknowledge our guilt. But we do more than that. 
we acknowledge the confidence that we have in God's ability to fix us, to fix our hearts. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about saying with our confession, God, I believe you can touch this part of my life and you can change this. You can make it better. Our brokenness is sometimes a product of our sins, sometimes a product of other sins, but our past consumes our emotional energy no matter whose fault it was. A story is told of a Filipino girl who claimed she actually talked to Jesus. Of course, everybody in the village was excited about the fact that she had talked to Jesus. And the Monsignor found out back in Manila, and he called for her to come and tell her about it. She, he was trying to prove that a miracle had really happened, that she had heard the voice of Jesus. It says that he interviewed her for three days. <laughs> and finally, he threw up his hands and he said, I, can't pr I cannot prove the veracity of her claim that she spoke to Jesus. But then he thought of a surefire way to figure out. So he, when he talked to her the next day, he said, uh, during the next week, when you talk to Jesus and, and he talks to you, I want you to ask him what I confessed the last time I went to confession. A week later, when the girl came back, the Monsignor eagerly asked, did you talk to Jesus this week? And she nodded her head. She had talked to Jesus this week. And so he said, did you ask Jesus what I confessed? And the little girl immediately replied, Jesus said, I've forgotten. When you confess today what you're struggling with, what you've not done that you should have or what you have done that has hurt somebody, next week, God will have forgotten. Not held you accountable for that, but invited you to a life of grace. That's what Jesus does for us. What freedom we can have this morning if we will accept that God is big enough, loving enough, strong enough, graceful enough to forgive even me. It's time for us to be delivered. It's time for us to be oiled by the oil of gladness. When told that Jesus bore our sins, it means he carried them, and we don't have to carry them anymore. How many times have you been to church and said, I'm so sorry, and left it at this altar, only at the end of the service following the benediction to come pick it up again and take it right out the door, still bearing the guilt, still the frustration, still the pain. I invite you this morning not to do that this time, to just leave it here. God has something to do with the other 50% of your energy. Because probably the first 50% is spent working, making a living, paying the bills, and doing the stuff you got to do. What if God freed you with that other 50% to really do something for him? Broken hearts can be mended. Lewis Smeets tells of going to the Los Angeles County Jail. He watched as pimps bailed out prostitutes, lawyers bailed out drug-dealing clients, and he casually judged them all. He just looked at them and said, they're all a bunch of losers. Well, that's at least what he was thinking. During the afternoon, he walked the grounds of the L.A. County Jail, and on the way, he saw a tall, lanky man dressed in a black shirt and a clerical collar. He thought for sure he knew what, who he was. He said, this must be the chaplain for the jail. As it turned out, he was an insurance salesman who wore the shirt so that people would know what he was trying to do. He used his distinctive dress so that the, that the people in the jail would come to him and talk, or at least hopefully so. And Smeed asked the man, aren't, aren't most of the men here inside hardcore losers? And the man responded with these words, Maybe that's true, but that's not how I divide up people. The only two categories of people that I really care about are forgiven people and unforgiven people. Today we are part of a club of forgiven people. We may start it this morning as part of the Broken Hearts Club, but the reasons for our brokenness, as varied as our hair, our eyes, our skin tones, 
our genders, our mistakes, our sin. But we share a common need to shed this pain, to get rid of the disgrace of our past and allow God to carry that and forget about it. God's been waiting a long time for that to happen. For us to use our whole selves in service to God's loving kingdom. David was called with his checkered past a man after God's own heart. Don't you think no matter what's happened in your life, God can call you God's own child? God is offering a heart of flesh in exchange, a heart of compassion and love in exchange for the, what the scriptures call a heart of stone. What a great thing to have a living and breathing and working heart that's 100% devoted to God. It's a pretty good exchange program to just bring our broken hearts and get a new one, a perfect one, a loving one, a grace-filled one. I don't know about you, but I think it's a pretty good deal, and I'm going to take it. Won't you? Let us pray.